So we start a new series today. And the series today is a, a little bit more history, but also we'll talk in the coming weeks about theology because in our tradition, in the Orthodox Church, you cannot separate history and theology. They are continually interwoven throughout the centuries. And so our new series is going to be on the ecumenical councils. We are many times called the Church of the Councils. And these seven great ecumenical councils, there were seven in world history, starting in the 300s and ending in the 700s. All of the councils, they solidified how we understand God and how we understand the role of the church and how we understand the organization of the church. Today, we're not going to talk about one of the seven. We're going to go back even further and we're going to talk about the Council of Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem was by the apostles themselves. And you'll find the Council of Jerusalem in chapter 15 of your Bible. Acts chapter 15. I suppose to tell you what book it's in. Acts chapter 15. And I'm going to read a little bit because this is the framework, this is the pattern that was established, that was established in how the church gathered when we began having these councils in the 300. So it was called the Council of Jerusalem. Now I have to set for you the stage. So Acts chapter 15, I'm going to read a few verses here. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So that's the first thing that I want to bring to our attention. One of the, um, I suppose you could say, accusations against the church in these council meetings is you hear a lot of people talking about the rules of men, the laws of men, that these councils, because God didn't say them, that we don't have to obey them. You'll hear things like that, especially in the contemporary Protestant world. However, it's important to note that when the church gathered for these councils, it was to resolve conflict. And that's why we want to read the first verses from Acts 15. There was a dispute, there was an argument, there was a disagreement. And the disagreement was basically do Christians who are not Jews, like us Greeks, do they have to be circumcised first? And some were saying yes, and some were saying no, and there was a big argument about it. It says here, no small dispute. For the scriptures to say no small dispute, you figure it must have been pretty big. <laughs> Right? And so what did they do? They said, well, we're going to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles. Remember, this is all establishing the framework on how the church addresses conflict. You see, in these seven great ecumenical councils that we're going to be studying over the next seven weeks, well, eight weeks including tonight, Never once did the church gather in a council to invent theology. Never once they sit down and say, okay, well, we have to believe something. Hmm. Hey, how about this? How about we believe in the Trinity? Or, hmm. The church never did that. These councils were gathered to 
resolve the conflict in the church. And what's so very important about that is we have to remember, before Christ went up on the cross, what did he pray for? Do you remember? Unity. Christ said that they may be one as we are one. And so the unity of the church is always incredibly important. And so when this great conflict, no small dissension, comes about circumcision, they said, that's fine, let's go ask the holy apostles. And so Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem. Now I'm going to skip a few verses and it continues. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know what a good while ago God chose among us, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And it goes on, and he's, he's giving this presentation, you could say, and a, an argument of why circumcision is not necessary for the Gentile Christians. And he's doing it by remembering the teachings of Christ. He didn't just pull something out of thin air. He remembered the decisions and he remembered the preaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he continues. So, again, I'm skipping around. So when you go home, read Acts chapter 15. You're going to read the whole story. I'm going to continue now. I'm going to skip over to verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Varsavas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, there's the theology part, right? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So right there is the example, the framework, the, you could say, the prototype of every church council. There was a conflict. The church gathers together, and the apostles remembered the teachings of Christ. And from that moment on, Christians, Gentile Christians, were not required to be circumcised. It was a theological truth that the apostles taught remembering the teachings of Christ. So, fast forward now, and we're going to talk about the first ecumenical council next week. But fast forward, once all the apostles are dead, 
And remember, only one apostle was not martyred. All the apostles except for John was martyred. So now here we are in the 300s, and there were conflicts, and we'll talk spe in specifics next week about the First Ecumenical Council. And so what did the church do? They looked back into their history, and they said, well, when the apostles had a conflict, this is what they did. They gathered the church together, they discussed it, they looked into the teachings of Christ, and they determined what Christ meant and what Christ taught. And then they sent out a written letter with witnesses to say, yes, I was there. This is exactly what they discussed. And so when the church began having these conflicts in the, third, in the 300s, they followed the same pattern. They gathered the church together. Now, who were the apostles since the original 12 were dead? Who were they now? Do you remember? Think about our class about ordination. Who were the apostles? The bishops. Very specifically, the bishops were the, remember we're talking about apostolic succession, where the bishops be, were the new apostles as the apostles were dying. We remember that's also in the book of Acts, how they replaced Judas with Matthias, apostolic succession. So they gathered and they went to the apostles, they went to the bishops, and all of the bishops gathered together and they had a debate. And then they wrote something down to explain to the people what the resolution was. And again, we're going to talk about those specifics next week. But keep this thing in mind. Every divine liturgy, we say a prayer. In Greek, we call it the pistevo. In English, the I believe, the creed. The first part of that was written at the first council meeting. We'll talk about that next week. And so what the creed is, is the written report, we could say. The written report of the resolution of the conflict. Right? And so just as the apostles themselves did in the book of Acts, the church did in the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth centuries. 325 through 787 was what's called the seven ecumenical councils. And there have been other councils through history, and we'll probably wrap up this series by talking about the recent council a couple of years ago that took place in Crete where much of the Orthodox world, although not all of it, gathered together in Crete, and now there are continuations of those conversations. So we'll learn a little bit of history, and then we're going to use that history, and we're going to use that theology that we learn by looking at some of the issues the church is dealing with today and say, well, may, how is this going to get resolved in the ancient Christian tradition? So go home today, open your Bibles, Acts chapter 15. And you're going to see the first council of Jerusalem. And you're going to see what they said about circumcision and what they said about the law of Moses and what they said about the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. And you're going to see how that set in motion this wonderful pattern of how the church resolves conflict within the family. Always trying to keep unity. Always trying to bring people together and remember what God originally said and what the Holy Apostles originally said. So that's going to be what we talk now. So there's seven councils, so we have a total, including today, we'll have eight sessions in this particular, maybe one more at the end, where we talk about some of the contemporary things moving into the future about how the church gets together in councils.